purpose of the screencast is to address what is educational psychology. And educational psychology is the field of psychology applied to the educational setting. So in other words, educational psychology is a very large field of study that includes such things as child development, the study of psychology applied, um, the, the study of child development applied to education, um, counseling psychology, the study of how the emotion and the um, cognitive um, well-being of students in the classroom. It also uh, includes how do we measure students' cognitive and emotional well-being in the classroom. So that's an area of study. Um, also includes uh, special education, which is the study of uh, students' cognitive disabilities or physical disability and how it uh, pertains to the classroom. But it also focuses just generally on how do students learn and what motivates them to learn. And that's the area of educational psychology that I got my degree in. So um, from that point of view, I asked the question, how do children and adults learn and what motivates them to learn? Our answers come from two areas, research and psychology, and they work really in concert with each other. And it's important for you to know what um, these two areas are. So research is the scientific method or a tool that uses the scientific method to investigate educational phenomenon. So scientific method is used in science and social science, um, and the tool is pretty much the same. It's you ask a question, you formulate a hypothesis, you engage in some kind of um, experiment or study, investigation, you collect data, and you analyze that data, and you draw conclusions from it or make inferences about what that data is saying. Um, so let's review some key vocabulary that I think might be helpful to you. Um, and those are having to do with the fact that we want to make inferences, we talk about validity and reliability. Inferences is what we ask our literacy students to do. We often ask them to read and to make inferences about what is happening. Um, well, that's what researchers do is they collect data and they are to make inferences about what it is saying. The validity of these conclusions rely on how the researchers have conducted their study. Um, they have to do some things to ensure that they are approaching validity and that is that the meaning of certain concepts or certain things are indeed reflecting what they should be. So if I'm doing a study on, the, on whether or not people perceive the color red, I need to make sure that the color that I am showing them is indeed red. So I have to have some kind of validity um, done to ensure that this is indeed what I say it is. Or if I'm doing a study on joy, and um, I am defining joy in a way that is reflective of what the community says or that people agree that this is in fact joy and not sorrow or anger. Um, more uh, specific to educational psychology, I may be wanting to do a study on motivation, so I have to be clear on what motivation is. I have to um, do some kind of uh, validity to, to, in defining what that concept is, and it has to reflect what the community, educational community, says um, is about motivation. So that's one area. The other is reliable. I want to ensure that something is reliable. That is, that if I get findings, if I'm going to share this with other people, 
I want to be certain that if I were to do this study again, that I'd come up with similar results. If I used the same population and the same study, I'd come up with same, um, the same results, that it isn't just a fluke. So that's reliability. So there's education research and research in general, if it's any good, it's going to try to make inferences that are valid and reliable, and there should be some effort to do so. Research is driven by theory. In other words, what I'm saying is we do research because we are interested in supporting theory or we are investigating a particular theoretical point of view. So um, theory is sort of guiding the kinds of studies that I might do research in. What is a theory? A theory is an explanation for a phenomenon. And I have this picture, and when I showed it to my kids, they freaked out. But I, it's, it sort of exemplifies, you know, why do people do what they do? And, you know, we come up with a theory, an explanation for why someone would do something like this. So that's what a theory is. Um, some popular theories that you know is what the theory of evolution. So it gives an explanation about how humans have evolved. Another popular theory is relativity, and I am not very good at explaining it, but it has something to do with creating a theory that explains time and space and that stuff. Um, something that I can talk about is the theory of child development and Piaget's child development um, theory or uh, constructivist theory. It, it's attempting to explain how do children develop cognitively? What are the things that need to happen? A good theory, a theory that, um, that a community of researchers tend to use is one that can explain a wide variety of social ideas or phenomena. So um, take, for example, altruism. So we wanted to come up with a theory about altruism. We want to be able to explain it not just in with regards to, let's say, the civil rights movement, but we want to have this theory apply to anywhere in the world. So a good theory should be able to explain what is going on in one area, but also, or one place, but also in another place. So it has some application, wide variety of application. Um, a narrow theory, a theory that is narrow, is one where it's limited in terms of its explanation. So I have, for example, let's, um, you know, we want to come up with a theory for how people eat. But if I can only explain why Obama is eating at McDonald's, if I come up with a theory for why he can he's eating at McDonald's, that's not a very good theory because I want to explain why people eat and the choices that make. So I need to choose something else. So a, a good theory, what we in the field call a robust theory, is something that can explain why kids eat what they eat, why adults eat what they eat, why people eat um, what they eat in the United States, why people might eat what they eat in China, and so forth. If it, ha if it can explain a variety of different um, phenomena, then it's a good theory. Um, to, to what makes a good theory is, of course, research. So there are researchers that say, hey, I want to do a, um, there's this really neat theory. I have an idea for a research study that might either support it or discount this theory. So this is where the research comes in. It says, all right, I want to do some kind of um, investigation to either support or discount this particular theory. So theories are only as good as long as people are doing some um, educational research or research to support it. That's what evolution was, is about, and people are still doing research studies to support this idea of evolution. That's what the theory of relativity is about. People are constantly doing research studies to support 
the claim or discount the claim. Um, so that's very important. Um, so a good theory about an educational ph phenomenon will need to have um, research, educational research done, where people go into the classroom to look at it, uh, what, what might be happening and how this, what is happening may support or discount a particular theory. Many educational theories really come from the field of psychology. So we're borrowing from social psychology, developmental psychology, cognitive psychology, abnormal psychology. Each of these fields may not have, um, may not be placed in education settings. So we could be looking at motivation in the dating world or how people develop um, as senior citizens or cognitive psychology in the workplace. All of those can be placed um, psychology that is undertaken outside of education. But since this is educational psychology, we can pull from these um, psychological theories and say, how do they relate or how, how do they tell us something about what's going on in the classroom or in the educational settings? So what does this mean for this class? and in teacher education. In this class, we're going to learn learning theory, in particular social constructivist theory, by Lev Vygotsky, who is Russian. This is a very contemporary learning theory. So if you go to any research or educational conference, or if you go to schools, you're pro um, and you ask them um, about what learning theory that they know about, they're probably going to tell you about uh, Vygotsky's social constructivism. Um, so uh, there's probably other learning theories that we could talk about, Skinner's behaviorist theory, um, even Piaget's uh, constructivist theory. Those are, Skinner, in the case of Skinner and behaviorism, that is not so contemporary. It's considered out of date. There's very few researchers who investigate using a behaviorist lens anymore because largely it is outdated for reasons that we won't go into in this uh, screencast. Um, Piaget is even to some degree out of date, although some people may still you, uh, engage in research in that area. But social constructivism is very much the hot topic, and that field has uh, spawned other related theories like activity theory and situated cognition and distributed cognition. All of those are tied and linked to Vygotsky. So that's one area of research that we will do. We will also look into motivational theory, which we will explore the idea of growth mindset by Carol Dweck and self-determination theory by DC and Ryan and attribution theory, which is um, a theory by Bernard Weiner. So those are some theories that we will draw upon to make sense of how students learn and what motivates them to learn. We will also use some research related to neuroscience. And what's interesting about neuroscience is that it's really confirming a social constructivist theory. So it's confirming the work that Leo Vygotsky um, theorized at the turn of the 20th century. Um, so, you know, here's the case of a theory, an explanation that came about. Somebody said, you know, this is what I think is going on. And he needed educational research or research to kind of support that. And a lot of the research wasn't really available to support his ideas until um, brain imaging technology uh, came online in the late 20th and the early 21st century. So what we're finding about the brain is that it really supports what Lev Vygotsky suggested uh, about 100 years ago. So this is really exciting times. Um, and I'm really excited to be sharing some of that research about, uh, about neuroscience and to show how it uh, supports what, uh, what Vygotsky said about learning. 
How does learning about theory or research help your ability to teach? Well, the way that I think you should think about it is think about theory as a lens. So there are different lenses that we can use. If we use a wide angle lens, we have this image over here. If we use a portrait lens, we have this image. So it changes how, what things become more visible. Here's another example. So without a lens, this is what I might see of the moon, but with a lens, I might get more detail. I might see things that I otherwise don't see. So that's what's really important, is that this is, education is a field in which um, many people are involved in it. And it's important to try to have a particular lens that, that helps us have common vocabulary and begin to see things that otherwise we might not see. This is the professionalization of teaching. Otherwise, if it's just whomever and whatever can do whatever uh, in terms of teaching, this is the view that they might see. But really, if we engage in investigation into the area of teaching and education, there are some things that we can really see and we need a lens to help us see it. So a theory gives us a lens to look at the complexity that is education. So I hope you will, um, you know, as you get into the classroom and you start practicing um, particular strategies, you could go the route of, well, let me try it. Let me see what the teacher down the hall is doing and let me try that. Or you can use the scientific method and engage in action research and have a lens to guide your thinking about what it is that you're doing. So if you're a social constructivist, then you might say, these are the things that I'm going to try out and see how they support uh, the theory, but also seem to have actual practice will be practical for you um, in the classroom. Get the results that you want. All right, so theory is like a lens. Let's see, let us, it lets us see the details and make sense of those details in a very systematic way. Um, and that's it. And I close out with a tribute to David Bowie. The next time I will probably do Prince, my favorite artist. Talk to you in class, bye-bye.